closed. And more than 300 clinics were closed uh, last year, 2000, 2018 to 2019, somewhere around that period, right? And there are many reasons for this. So it doesn't mean that you go into general practice, that's where you're going to stay. And there's many ways of looking at this. We will come to that. Now, the landscape for general practice has changed. Say in 20 years ago, it was probably a little bit easier and um, a lot more uh, there were less clinics, of course, and if you look at your, your parents or your parents' time, if they were doctors and they had general practices, the general practices, the way they were run, were slightly different from the way it is run today. There are a lot more uh, general practice clinics today, all right, so there's a lot more competition, and you need to be able to stand out in your practice. Okay, so how does a general practitioner earn? It's different here than if you were, say, in Australia or in the States. In Malaysia, as a general practitioner, you earn your income, your source of income is from your patients, and there's two sources, cash patients, which basically the patient comes in and gives you cash, or panels. And uh, panel patients are, you sign up under the TPAs, third party administrators, and then your panel patient comes in and you are remunerated. Um, uh, subsequently, maybe up to three months later, basically. Uh, so you'd want something like uh, a higher percentage or a more balanced percentage with the uh, cash inflow and the panel income because there's a delay in the payment in that sense. In Malaysia, we charge consultation fees, which is kind of regulated to some extent. And the, uh, the, the consultation fees is anything from 15 ringgit to 35 ringgit depending on where you're located and uh, the, the type of patients that you see, the income group that they are. So um, we make most of our money from the medicines that we sell, which is different from, in let's say, in the States, where basically what happens is you charge your consultation fee from anything from 50 USD up to 200, depending on the type of consultation and how long it takes. But here in Malaysia, we are very dependent on the medication as part of our earning, uh, which raises again some challenges because the pharmaceutical side wants to separate the dispensing. There are good points to that and there are bad points to that also. Okay, so this is how we work in that sense. Okay. Now, how do you, uh, I'm addressing, I'm not sure uh, what background y'all are coming from, so I'll address it in two ways. Those who are already in general practice and what you can do to enhance your practice. But let's start off with how, for those of you who are yeah, just leaving the government or planning on leaving the government, how do you get into general practice? So the first thing is you have to complete the housemanship and then you have to complete your, uh, uh, you know, there's three compulsory years of government service. When you complete that and you get a full practicing cert, then you apply for your annual practicing, the APC. When you have a valid APC, that's where you are legally, uh, legally ready to come out and, and either own your own clinic or work in a general practice. Um, if you are staying with the government, I think there is a requirement that if you are doing locum or something like that, you have to get permission to do such a thing. Yeah. Okay, so I'm addressing those who want to leave the government and join general practice. So once you've made that decision, before you make that decision, all right, I seriously urge you to really look into yourself and really try and understand what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses and what is it that you want from this career of yours, all right? Whether it is to stay in, med in the medical line and currently right this minute, we're talking about staying in the medical line as a general practitioner, okay? So the first thing before you decide that would be to really understand what it is you want from your career and then what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? Why this is important is because if you're like someone who needs to be in a, in a, uh, a really active and high adrenaline kind of situation, general practice is probably not the best place for you. You'd want to stay in a hospital set up, work in the ICU or emergency department in those kind of things. When we come to general practice, uh, basically, um, one second. All right, when we're looking at general practice, we're looking at patients from the womb to the tomb. 
you can see anyone from a, a, a five-day-old baby all the way up to a hundred-year-old grandfather. And the nice thing about this is that we are we are family physicians in the sense that we take care of a uh, of a person from the time they're a child all the way up till they're an adult. They have children, and you get to know these families really well, and you're able to um, take care of them in a very unique way that you do not find in a hospital. Because in the hospital, you're focused just the medicine. If there's an eye problem, you send them to eye, and then they're not your problem anymore. So it's very divided. But in general practice, you're looking at a whole the whole structure of the family and how that child's health is affected by their family like i see a lot of uh, mental health issues uh, patients also teenagers today and all their um, uh, stresses and all the things that they go through and you have it is very helpful if you know where they're coming from and their family in which they're in and that helps you to practice medicine a lot better you know their aller allergies you know what their plans are you know uh, i've seen patients from the time they were in diapers until now they're about 12 13 years old and we've i've followed them up through the different clinics that i've gone i followed these kids up so i know that if this child is uh, uh, having a cough, I know their background, I know that they're asthmatic, I know what they're allergic to. It makes it, it's, it's got this nice, wholesome sense to general practice. You become the jack of all trades, from um, ophthalmology to taking out bees from somebody's ear to, you know, uh, 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 from doing an IND to anything. It's like literally your day begins and there's like a whole vast range of patients that can come to you. I've had patients with MIs and we had diagnose it, stabilize it, send it off. We've had patients with strokes. We've had patients with epilepsy. So yes, we do get a lot of challenging patients. I've seen patients with acute appendicitis, um, an adult male with um, intersusception, unusual. So there are lots of interesting cases. It's basically, what are you looking for? All right, and once you know, let's say you've been in general practice for a while, then you can start deciding, hey, look, I find that I have a tendency of uh, spending more time with mental health issue patients. So you know that this is the direction you can enhance and you can specialize. You can do programs to help uh, further that interest. And I'll come to that in a while. But the main thing is once you're in general practice, what are your interests? And you grow from there. Okay, so we talked about uh, what, do you, what are the documents you need? And the next step is finding a job, right? Finding a job. Now, there is a couple of ways that you can work in general practice, all right? The first thing, and I, I recommend this to any of you who are still in the government practice and you're still considering, do I come out as a general practitioner or not? The first thing you probably would want to do is actually start doing locum. Now, when you do locum, you're literally working in a specific clinic for a specific number of hours. Now, I have this thing where there's two types of medical uh, general practice for me. There's the locum mentality, and then there's the family physician type of practice. Locum mentality is, um, you'll see that they come, they're your locum doctors, they'll come, they'll, give, uh, they'll see the patient, they'll give them about six or seven different types of medicine, consultation is done, right? That's like a locum mentality. How do you maximize what medicines you give to a patient and how you treat them? All right, so that's one aspect of it. I call that the local mentality. Uh, the other aspect is the family physician, the family practitioner, where you, uh, you look at the whole, the psychosomatic, emotional aspect of a patient, and you're looking at so many different angles for this one person, and then you're treating them, taking into consideration all these different factors. So that's one thing you have to be aware of, but I would definitely recommend that before you jump into general practice, find clinics that vibe or are in line with your uh, ethical uh, values and uh, practice medicine that you're comfortable with and try it out for a while and see, is this something that I, I enjoy doing? Uh, can I sit in a chair for eight hours a day? Can I see coughs and colds and different patients? How can I, um, enjoy this? Do I enjoy this? These are the questions you need to be asking. All right, so like I say, let's say you, you've decided, all right, I want to go into general practice. I'm leaving the government, I want to go into general practice. So what can you do next? The next thing is, you can either look for jobs, Job Street, and there's a whole bunch of uh, sites that have this, 
and you can decide that I want to join uh, uh, an existing clinic as a permanent doctor. You can either be a permanent doctor where you get a salary every month, or you can be a permanent locum. So that's either you're paid every month or you're paid based on the hours that you work, right? Uh, permanent doctor, the benefits are you have EPF and SOXO, and um, it's easier to manage in that sense. Don't forget your taxes. Those are crazy things. Okay, so another way is that you can open up your own clinic. Now, opening up your own clinic is challenging. It's interesting. And I do not regret having done that. It was a, a great learning opportunity for me and I enjoyed it as long as I could. So what happened was, um, what happens is when you are trying to own your own clinic, there's two things you can do. You can start a clinic from scratch all right, meaning it's uh, you, you, you go, you view a location, and remember the first thing to know is location, location, location. It's very important to choose the correct location. And what are the things that you take into consideration when you're looking? Let, so, we're talking about getting your own, starting your own clinic from scratch. You're looking at three main things. Try to make sure that there is a good uh, proportion of residents. A residential areas around okay a commercial area meaning there should be banks and shops and stuff like that so you get your clients from your patients from there too and the third is a, a industrial area factories and stuff because then you can broach out and, and and you know address the health issues for those factories yeah so these are the three things when you're looking at location you're looking at um, the type of uh, community that you're going to be serving uh, it is good to have a mix of these three commercial, industrial, and residential. So you've got different sources of people coming in, right? And then the next thing you look at is uh, the type of patients that you're gonna be seeing, the income group that they're in. Is it lower middle class? Are you looking at upper class? So because that tells you roughly how you're gonna charge a patient and the type of patients that you're gonna be seeing. So if you're looking at lower middle class or middle class, and right now, especially with COVID and everything going on, how you charge the patient is going to make a difference in how the patients come to you because everybody has really taken a hit with the COVID, especially in the lower middle class income group. Yeah. Okay. So you've got the location, you've got, uh, you understand the dynamics of uh, the population around you. Okay. And uh, the thing about starting a clinic from scratch, the good point is that it's yours from the beginning. You know, every aspect of it. All right. And, uh, I would divide it into the legalities, which is basically registering with, uh, once you found the clinic, then there is registering it with KKM and getting that whole paperwork stuff done, all right? And then setting up the clinic, meaning you literally have to buy everything. You may have to have some construction done and, and, and renovation to, there's very specific criteria on how to set up a clinic and there are uh, links to that. You can always contact me if you're interested. Uh, there's very specific guidelines that our commentarian has set up, how big a room should be, what uh, measurements of the door, how to be handicap able, those kind of things. Yeah. Okay, so uh, once you've got those things going, you set the cleaning up from the beginning, uh, from scratch, meaning you buy the furniture, you set up the medicine, the equipment, your examination couch, your table, the layout, everything starts from scratch. All right, so there's a lot more work and it takes a lot more probably effort and time and uh, financial income to support you during this uh, period, right? Because um, you're starting a, scratch, uh, a clinic from scratch, literally from zero and you need to bring it up. So location and uh, setting up the clinic, then the hiring of the staff, getting the right staff to come in, um, those kind of issues. Right, so now you've got the clinic, you've got the legal stuff settled out, you've also got to get the signboard and a whole bunch of things settled out, you've developed your clinic, you've designed your clinic, it's built, you've, ha you've got the medicine, you've got everything um, uh, that you need in a clinic, and then you've also got the uh, staff in place, you start running your clinic. Now, I would recommend, whether you're starting your own clinic or you're taking over a clinic, have at least six months, preferably a year's cushion of finances, just in case, because we never know what's going to happen. So you need this financial cushion to see you through a year. It takes about three to six months, sometimes up to a year, before a clinic starts picking up, again, depending on the location and um, a whole bunch of other issues. So that financial cushion would be really good. 
Uh, so how do you decide how much you need? Number one, take into account the expenditure that you're going to have on the clinic, which is basically the rent of the clinic, the utilities, paying the staff, and uh, getting your medication. These are the basic things that you have to account for when it comes to your expenditure in the clinic. You also have to look at is what are the loans that I have? What are the basic necessities that I have to cover? So let's say that you're spending something like uh, in the region of about 8,000 to 10,000 really tightly uh, expended on a clinic and you need something like seven, 8,000 to manage your life. So you're looking at something like 18,000 a month. So you need to plan for a year of that. So it would be very good for you to have a small amount of cushion, six months to a year, to allow yourself to breathe as you build up the clinic. Again, remembering you're starting from zero and you have to give time. Patients come through word of mouth and how you advertise. Remember, we're not allowed to advertise. So how do you advertise without advertising? Uh, literally is number one, have a blood bank at your clinic. Advertised in that sense, blood donation. You can also have, uh, uh, you know, like health screening, free health screening, uh, which you just check your glucose or you just uh, uh, blood pressure check or ultrasound. So uh, there are different ways that you can advertise your clinic in the sense that, hey, look, we're having a free ultrasound week. So anybody who comes in, uh, you get a free ultrasound, 2D or whatever it is based on your skill. Or we're going to have, hey, we're going to have a uh, medical checkup for uh, 50 ringgit or something like that. And you advertise it in that sense. So this is Basically what you need is you need to start bringing patients into your clinic so that you can start seeing them and by word of mouth, it starts to spread. Yeah. And I find that one of the biggest things that help a clinic succeed is how you connect to your patients. The basic of everything is how do you connect to that patient? When that patient leaves, what do you ultimately want is that patient should go away feeling they were listened to their issues were addressed. And sometimes it's not as simple as they come in with a, a, a headache. You find out that actually what's happening is there's a, this whole bunch of stress that's going on at work and that patient will start crying. And if you, can, if you just address the headache, the patient goes back with not fully satisfied because this other issue of stress is still not being managed. So if you can come back to the root cause, the relief that you see on their faces and the, 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 the uh, level of comfort when they leave you know you've done something to change that person's, to alleviate the patient's suffering in some small part. You connect to that patient and that's when you start building something that means something to you and you mean something to the community around you, right? So this is regarding owning your own, how do you set up your own clinic? Now, what I did was I bought over a pre-existing clinic, an existing clinic and the doctor wanted to sell it simply because um, um, she wanted to do other things at that point in time. So buying over a clinic is, for me, I found it easier because um, there was already a setup. Everything was there. I just had to fine tune it. I had to fine tune the medication to uh, fit what I like to prescribe. I had to just buy a few instruments that uh, I preferred and pretty much the clinic was ready to go. It was a, a running practice. So my only job was then transferring the legalities again, transferring our, uh, the ownership of the clinic into my name, which is a process, very clear cut and uh, lots of paperwork. I hate paperwork. All right, so um, those were the things that, coming up with the name of the clinic was interesting to me. Yeah, so it was a lot easier for me uh, because it was a, a pre-existing clinic. So they were seeing some amount of patients. So I had a, a small amount of income at that time. That, uh, the previous doctor had actually shut down the clinic uh, or, or was operating at 50% its capacity. Um, so the income was not uh, what I needed it to be, but it was a start. So that's uh, the differences between setting up your own clinic and buying over an existing clinic. Yeah, okay. Um, so, right. So what did we do so far? We looked at, you can go in a uh, general practice. You can go in as an employee. Uh, you can come in as an employer where you own your own clinic. And I've talked about the two different ways that you can buy a clinic or own your own clinic. All right. And another group of people are just permanent locomers, which literally means they permanently just do locum and they fit it according to your schedule. Uh, 
okay, it depends again on what you want uh, in life, number one, and how much of satisfaction you're going to get with that. Uh, and also your earning capacity. You probably will need to work many, many hours to make, um, to meet your needs because locum currently in Malaysia is at about 40 ringgit an hour and uh, in some clinics, 50 ringgit an hour. Uh, not very rarely do clinics go higher than that, uh, even if they're very busy clinics. Now, um, okay, and then there's another branch of uh, general practice that I do want to bring to your attention is doctor to you and door to door doctor, concierge medicine, which is basically, um, it's more, it has apps and all these things and you can actually look into this where um, people nowadays want doctors to go to their houses and literally what they do is you get onto this, uh, this group, you join the group and then in your area, according to your timings, when you're available, if there's a patient who needs you, you link up with them. So that's something for you to consider also. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we talked about this. It's, it is, it has been a very interesting journey. And the thing is, um, there are some things that I didn't really realize is that when you have your own clinic, right, you literally have to do everything. That means all this while, I, as an employer, I was just focusing on seeing patients and the medicines and the management of the patient. But when you own your clinic, it's a whole different ballgame. You have to understand that you have to manage the finances, the taxes, uh, manage the staff. You have to look at medicines. You have to... I learned a lot about toilets and plumbing, which I never thought I'd have to learn. I, I, I literally know what kind of pipes to buy and what happens if the water supply stops and what happens if you know you don't have electricity or the lights are flashing at you all these things are part of running your clinic so it's when you have your own clinic it's not just the management of the patients you have all these other managerial and uh you know existing things that you have to do about running the clinic and that can be quite challenging because it eats up a lot of your time also Right. One of the biggest challenges I faced uh, in running my own clinic, by far the hardest thing to do was staff. Um, the area that I was in, the turnover rate for staff was really high. And initially I thought, oh my God, is it just me? But when I started making friends with the other owners in the area and you know the, the people, the other uh, businesses in the area, I realized that there's a high turnover rate that the, people, the young people that, you can, that come in, um, they want minimal work, no need to work very hard and a lot of money. They want a lot of income for very little uh, expertise and that's very difficult to manage. So I think the biggest difficulty I faced was handling staff. You would think it's easy and I get along with uh, staff, um, you know, when I'm employed. But it's, it's really difficult when uh, you're a boss and you're managing this stuff, trying to achieve a balance between being their friend and also telling them what needs to be done and it needs to be done, all right? It becomes a bit of an issue, yeah? And uh, the second challenge was, um, um, remember I told you to have that financial cushion? It takes time for a clinic to pick up. Uh, again, depending on, uh, that's why if you're buying a pre-existing clinic, you really need to look into why is that doctor selling the clinic and how is the, look at the finances of the clinic and literally look at how much they're making and the type of patients. And if you can, lock them in the clinic for a while so that you have a realistic uh, understanding of how it is. And like I said, um, uh, look at the ways that you can draw in patients. I found that an interesting challenge because it makes you step out of your comfort zone and look at different ways to actually uh, contribute to the society around you. We actually went to different kindergartens. My clinic, we had a clinic t-shirt and uh, me and my staff, we went and we had health talks in the uh, different um, uh, areas like in kindergartens and uh, shops and stuff like that. And it's like I said, it's not just about practicing medicine. There's a whole bunch of managerial and plumbing and electricity and staff and finances and all these things that come into play when you are running your own clinic.
Okay. What are the things that I wish I had known uh, venturing into this time? I'm quite an adventurous person and I'm optimistic at most parts of my life. Um, yeah. So I went in really knowing what, that I was passionate about medicine, that I liked seeing patients and that I could help them. Right. So in that sense, yes, all that stuff was there, but some of the things that I wish I had known was a little bit more business minded. Now, um, I understand you have to understand that running a clinic, all right, you are serving community. Yes, but you also are running a business. And you have to have some basic idea of what is a business plan, what is your business strategy, and how do you how do you learn about these things? So you have to equip yourself with the knowledge, your business sense, your business knowledge has to go up to match your uh, medical knowledge because you have to understand you are now running a business as well as a medical practice. So do not neglect in that. I neglected on that and I had to learn. Um, as I was on the job, which was a little tougher for me, right? Managing finances is basically optimizing and really understanding um, how much you need to expend on your clinic and how to maximize the, um, uh, uh, what you're using, all right? And uh, remember, always have that financial cushion to cushion you through, especially now with COVID and things like that three months, lots of clinics close down during that time. So if you're closing your clinic for a couple of months, how are you gonna sustain yourself? That's a very important thing that you need to, it is very good that when you start out, you look at all the things that could possibly grow wrong and you plan for it. So you're hoping for the best, but you're planning for all the risks that you can see and you're setting up a, a, a safety net for the times when you're facing um, uh, issues that you cannot, you could not have predicted because no one can predict COVID-19, things like that. So that's the second thing I wish I had been a little bit more aware of. The third thing is, I found it, one of the reasons I left, I sold my clinic. I sold my clinic I, at a higher price than I bought it at. For me, that was a victory. And I learned a lot. I, learned, I, don't, I don't regret it in, in, at any point. But it was, uh, I reached a point where I was ready to move on. And one of the reasons is because when you're, you own a clinic, right? Um, a lot of the time when I started to try and cut, I was working really long hours from nine in the morning to 10 at night, every single day. All right. And I have a family. So my family life and work balance was really unequal. I tried to shift my three kids into the back room and not very helpful. It helped to some extent, but it was not, um, an ideal situation. Um, and I found that when I started to try and cut back my hours and put locum in, the uh, patient load would just dr drop down tremendously and they would wait for the next, they'd rather wait for the next day to see me than uh, see the locum doctor. So you're looking at um, those kind of issues and it's kind of lonely sometimes when you're trying to, you're doing this all by yourself and you have to manage staff and there's so many issues and all those things. I think I, if I had to do this again, I'd go in with a partner. So you have someone to share that, uh, that burden and the responsibility. And I would probably, these are the three basic things that I wish I had known a little bit more about. And I would have probably changed the way I uh, approach general practice. Yeah. And I find that solo clinics are finding it a lot harder to survive these days than if you are part of a branch. So what you could look at is, linking up with um, uh, things like Mediveron or Alamedic. So these are, uh, it's based, like, let's take uh, Mediveron um, started by Dr. Lim and basically it's got many branches and now you can come in as an associate doctor, all right? Meaning you have your own clinic and uh, associate doctor means you're linked up with Mediveron and there are hundreds of panels come to you. So what happens is whenever all the cash patients, you earn that income, it's yours, but any panel patient that comes in through Mediviron, basically you pay them a percentage of, I think it's about 10 to 15% right now, I think 15%. So let's say you're seeing a patient and your con the whole uh, fees comes to about, um, okay, let's just say 100 ringgit to make it simpler, 15% of that goes to Mediviron. 
all right? And that involves a lot of paperwork and stuff like that. So this is another thing that you can look into is uh, coming in as an associate uh, do partner with uh, associate doctor with Mediviron or Alamedic or those things because it's becoming much tougher to run a solo clinic. Yeah, and medication also, if you're in a group practice, it uh, is uh, cheaper because uh, you can buy medicine in bulk. So these are the basic three things I wish I had known. All right, what are the pros? Well, the pros is that I enjoyed being my own boss. I loved it. I could decide the direction of my clinic. I could decide uh, to practice ethically. I, I decided how much of effort, it, it was like my baby. The effort, the love and the blood and the sweat and the sacrifice that went into it literally was like having a, three, a, a newborn baby. Right? But I love that. I like that a lot. Now, when your clinic takes off, you have financial independence. And that's really nice to have. Yeah? And you can grow your clinic in any direction that you need it to grow in. The cons. I, I found that the long hours, uh, there was very poor family and career balance. And um, that caused me to feel really lonely. I was very conflicted because... You know, all those hours in the clinic and then my kids uh, were a little younger at that time, probably just beginning going into their teens and my son was about 10-ish. So it's like a very critical time and um, they kind of, I kind of dropped the ball when it came to the kids for a while and it took me a long time to gain back that connection with them. So that was one of the key points in why I sold my clinic. And I did get lonely, lonely in the sense that solo practice, it's just me and there's so many patients and dealing with stuff and all those things, yes, but there was no um, professional input, no adult conversations and stuff like that. So um, I, I started to feel lonely. I started to have burnout. I started to feel what was the point. My kids were not really having a mom at home. So that, that, that those long hours and the poor family career balance, that literally led me to giving up my practice. I enjoyed it, but it was time to move on, yeah? And I found it quite challenging managing a clinic, looking at all the other aspects. So if you enjoy that uh, diversity, um, this is something that, you would, that would be good for you. I found it a lot more challenging. So that was one of my cons. Now, how do you know it's right for you? How do you know that going into general practice is right for you? So I would say the first thing you need to do is you really need to know who you are. You need to sit down by yourself and you really need to know who are, who are you? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And then the next thing is, what do you want your medical career to be like? What do you see yourself doing in five years? What makes you happy right now? Yeah. And I actually, you know, when I saw my clinic last year in October, I took about five months off. And I took time to pause because I haven't paused in the past 10 years. Medical school, finished that, straight into the government, then into private practice, then it went on and on and on. And I never took time to take, I didn't take any time off. So after selling the clinic, I, I literally put the pause button and I did a lot of personal growth. And I did something like called Life Book where I looked at the different areas of my life and I actually sat down for the first time and put down on paper what I wanted, what were my values in each area of my life, what did I want, what did I need to see happening, and what were the steps that I could take to, to achieve that. So the more I knew about myself, the clearer I was in what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so that's, that was a very important thing for me. And uh, a trial run. Yeah. Uh, how do you know this is right for you? Do a trial run. Work in clinics for a while. Work in the clinic that you're thinking of taking over or buying or partnershiping with. Look, uh, work there. Is this for you? Be really honest about yourself. And then when uh, the next thing you need to do is have a review system in place. Have a check-in with yourself. How am I feeling? How are the areas of my life? Is there any area that I would uh, is suffering because I'm concentrating so much in a different area? So if you have a review system, you find that you don't run into burnout so fast because you're very clear about what you want. And this can change as time goes on. As you grow as a person, 
how you feel about things grows also. The more you know about yourself, the more uh, what, you, what is important for you changes. Right, uh, before I come to this, there's, um, uh, now, for those of you who are already in medical practice, uh, in general practice, right, and starting to feel a bit burnt out and everything is the same, I'm getting a lot of cough and colds, uh, challenging patients are not really there. Um, oh, missed it. Second. What do you do next? And uh, what, how do you enhance your practice? Just give us a sec. Okay, so... Family medicine today, you are not required to have a, a postgraduate degree or diploma in uh, family medicine before you practice, right? That there, is, there are plans to change that, but it hasn't taken place yet. So what can you do if you have decided you want to uh, enhance your knowledge uh, and become a family physician, all right? Uh, there are a couple of ways to do it. Number one is you can do a master's in family medicine. This is by the public universities, UKM, USM, UM have it. But this is a full-time course. You have to leave your private sector, pay a lot of money and get into their, one of their programs, right? Uh, and uh, in the master's of family medicine, you rotate in different departments and you come out with a, as a specialist, right? A family physician. And you are in the uh, specialist registrar. Okay, so that's the public uh, route. Now, the next thing is FRACGP. It's run by the uh, Malaysian Academy of Family Physicians. And it's a four-year, it's currently a four-year program. And uh, it's recognized in Australia also. Um, the examiners come down from Australia. And they've now divided it into two parts. You do a diploma, a two-year uh, diploma, a vocational training, and, and you get a diploma. And then after that, you do a two-year ATP program at the end of which there's an exam. And after you pass the exam, then you can apply to become a fellow of the Royal Australian um, College of General Practitioners, meaning you can also practice in Australia. So this is also a very good uh, program to consider. Uh, four years long, um, and there's lots of, it, it's all online. So in this program, you can continue do uh, having your practice you can continue working and you can study on your own hours yeah now there's a new program the uh, rcsi ucd program uh, just started recently um a couple of months ago actually and uh this is a program up in Kinang. um it is a recognized uh irish medical degree uh, and it's accredited by the uh, royal college of surgeons in ireland and the University College of Dublin. And you come out as a family physician, a specialist again. So in these, when you do these things, you come out as a specialist in family medicine and you are able to put your name into the National Specialist Register. So these are for those of you who want to specialize in family medicine. But again, the, uh, the, R, uh, the RCI program is full-time. You will literally have to do it full-time. So again, finances and time and shifting to Penang. I think they're starting one, they already have one in KL, but those are issues that you will probably have to face. Now, the next thing you could do is be in general practice without these degrees, but there are courses. Let's say you're interested in diabetes, all right? The University of Warwick has um, an online, a fully online program where you can enhance your knowledge in diabetes. This doesn't make you a specialist in diabetes, but it makes you an expert in the management of diabetes. So you would probably be a, a general practitioner with a interest or a, a, an interest, a special interest in diabetes. So that is one of the ways that you can enhance your level of uh, practicing in general practice. There are other programs like um, uh, the University of Warwick also has one in pediatrics. They have, um, you can also do a, a master in uh, public health, right? And uh, there are small diplomas by the Acad uh, Academy of uh, Family Physicians, which are on dermatology and on ophthalmology, mental health. So these little, little programs that you come out with a diploma. And these are different ways that you can make your practice of family medicine a lot more interesting and you are one step more higher than uh, the clinics around you. 
Yeah? So this is something, this is one way where you can still improve yourself, enhance your practice, and get better job satisfaction. Yeah? Because ultimately, what do we want? We want to be happy and we want to feel that we're contributing and we want to earn financially enough to provide for our families. Right, so these are all the things and the different aspects that we have talked about. And I'd like to wrap things up by saying that problems are gifts in unusual wrapping. My life has been very challenging and I faced many challenges over the years. And you have a choice. The problems are always, the challenges are always going to be there. But the only difference, the only thing in your control is how you're going to view that. And I have come to view problems as gifts. So whenever I faced an issue, like when I was selling the clinic, my heart was breaking because I had to do it in order to, 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 to help my children, in order to be there as a parent. Um, I had to do that. But if my heart was breaking, I was like literally selling a baby of mine, right? Um, and, and for a long time, I was like, oh my God, this is the worst thing that could happen to me. Um, I'll be viewed as a failure and stuff like that, right? But what happened was, it was actually this, this challenge in my life was a gift. And I had to really step back and take some time to find out what was the gift in this difficult time in my life. And basically, I came to the conclusion that it has given me the finance, it gave me the finances to do my personal growth, to take some time off, to really understand who I was and understand what I wanted in medicine, what I didn't want in medicine. So that was the gift. Every problem that you're facing, every challenge that you're facing is like a gift. That problem is a gift. And if you peel back the layers, you will come to a gem inside. And that gem will be something that you learn that enhances your life. All right, so good luck, everyone. If you have any more questions, please do ask. I'm okay. done. Thanks, Kavita. That was a very, very profound talk. Like, it's really interesting because most people, like, when you go into general practice and all that, you just think it's just being, it's just medicine. Like, I'm coming in and then I'm a doctor and then, I just have to deal with all that, right? And then, but there's the business aspect of it that none of us see. I mean, us doctors, we're not trained with all this business lingo and all this business skills. So all of a sudden that all this is coming in, it's a, I, I can understand how it's a, such a steep learning curve. Um, okay, so actually we have a question. Dr. Kavita, do you think concierge medicine will be a recognized specialist field in the future? Thank you. Well, at the moment, no, it's not. It's not a specialized field. Um, the challenges of concierge medicine is basically uh, you're limited in terms of what equipment you're having because you're actually going to a patient's location. So in terms of what you can do there is based on what you can carry with you. So at this point, that is probably a challenge. It's interesting because you're dealing with, we've had um, uh, TV shows on this. I forgot the name of it, but yeah. Um, as a speciality, I haven't at this point in time actually looked, heard of anything where concierge medicine is an actual uh, specialist field. Uh, it's a lot more common in the European countries, uh, but in Malaysia, not yet, not at all. Okay, I was just curious, how much does it cost to start up a clinic? Say, I want to go into general practice. I want to start my yeah. own clinic. How much would that cost? Okay, right. Like, okay, for me, basically, I bought the... Okay, when you're looking at a pre-existing clinic, right? Um, when someone is selling the clinic, what they will do is they will look at how many patients... What is the income per month at that point? And there's actually a calculation, 10 months of income or one year of income, and that's the cost that they're selling the clinic for, right? But um, it depends, again, on the level of uh, success the clinic is having how many patients and all those things so the range of uh, buying a clinic uh, in the past couple of years that i've been when i was buying my clinic was somewhere between um 50 to seventy thousand. that's a clinic that's really slowing down or shut down up to it went up anywhere to about wow about half a million there were clinics wow. that were being for half a million but those were being advertised as really busy clinics and really successful clinics right okay. dr Izad said yeah how much success uh, financial cushion i would say 
to be safe, if you can have a one year financial cushion, that would be uh, how much would that be? Like a average, like okay. in ringgit. I guess they they want to right. see like the in ringgit. All right. So again, when you break that down, right, you need to know, like, okay, let me take that clinic that I owned, right? The, uh, the clinic that I owned, I was, if I was very strict, I could keep the overheads down to about 9,000 to 10,000, all right? Okay, that's one aspect of it. Second aspect is I needed about 7,000 to survive in my family life because I had loans and stuff. So 17,000, I would probably need 17,000 times 12. How much does that come to? Any mathematicians around? So that would have been 17,000 times 12. You're looking at, well, about 200,000. 200, so I basically, what I did was I did it in a way, uh, there's a couple of ways you can get past this financial cushion. Number one is my dad invested in me. So he was my financial cushion. I had probably half of that. I had something like 100,000 as a small cushion for me, all right? And my dad uh, was my finance minister. Another way you can do this is actually get an investor, someone to invest in the clinic, all right? And that helps you do that. But basically, I would, uh, the, the, what I would want you to look at is, how much do you think the overhead of the clinic is? How much are your monthly expenses, the minimum that you can really pare it down to? And try and prepare for at least six months to one year for that, yeah? And okay. as your income is coming in, put aside something for a rainy day. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, anyone has any more questions? Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kavita, do you think they can like drop you an email if they have anything sure. they want to ask you? Definitely. If you have any questions or you want to know something, uh, please drop me an email. I'm sure that uh, Selena will pass it to you all. Um, right. Okay, someone's asking. Can, can we, we pursue? pursue so go ahead. Sorry, Selena. Can we pursue in pain management or pain specialist as career or intercept as GP? Yes, you can. You can also pain management is a very uh, unique field and it's a satisfying field because to what a patient who has been in pain for so long and now you are offering them methods to reduce that pain. Um, Awesome, really good. Do that if you're interested in it. And you will be dealing a lot with uh, cancer patients also, chronic fatigue syndromes, all the pains that come in the various forms. And yes, I would encourage you to do that. There are small courses. I haven't come across a diploma per se, but there are small courses in pain management uh, in uh, general practice. But literally in general practice, you can go into any subset you want. And with the internet today, you will find something to, to, to enhance your knowledge in that uh, field that you're interested in. So go for it, anonymous attendee. Okay, um, sorry Kavita, what's your email again? Can you just uh, read it out and somebody will okay. type it in the chat. Right, okay, all in small, uh, P-A-R-V-K-S. Uh, that's Penang, uh, Asia, Russia, uh, Venezuela, Kangaroo, Singapore, at yahoo.com. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, okay, so anyone, um, any of you attendees want to be involved in Medic Footprints because we are just stepping up. We need, uh, we need more, um, more members. Uh, so you can actually drop me an email at selena at medicfootprints.org and then um, let's see how we can work together and build this. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Izzat. What's your view on very specialized family clinic general practice with family interest in women's health? Okay, there, currently what's happening in general practice is, let's say a doctor is interested in women's health. They don't advertise it, but you'll find that they see a, a, maybe 80% of the patients are um, pregnant women or antenatal cases or postnatal cases. So at the moment in Malaysia, we don't advertise it. It's more of a word in, of mouth. But I feel that in order for you to really feel job satisfaction, specialize in a field that really interests you. And uh, women's health, booming. It's really, women are everywhere, yay. <laughs> but women have a lot of health concerns and they need someone that they can talk to. And uh, most of the times your patients come to you because they trust you. 
all right? And they trust you to follow them when they go to a hospital consult. They trust you to explain things to them when they come back. So women's health, yes, I would say it's a very good thing to specialize in too. Again, there are many little, little courses and um, you could look at the Academy of uh, uh, Family Practitioners in Malaysia uh, and look online to universities in uh, the UK or in, well, I've been focusing on UK basically. They have a lot of online courses. Okay, all right. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Bhavani, thank you so much for your time. And uh, it was a very, very powerful story on your part. Like, I mean, coming up in the open with this and your journey is just very phenomenal from somebody who is like IT illiterate to somebody who is like heading this um, national um, ICT healthcare um, project. I, I think that's, um, that, that's something that we can all learn from. Um, so thank you so much again for your time. Uh, you. Is there anything else you want to see, say, Dr. Babani? Uh, thank you very much, Selena, for uh, providing me this opportunity to speak, uh, for me to enrich other people's lives. So uh, like what we have discussed earlier, you can drop, uh, uh, if you need any queries, please. Uh, communicate via my email and we take it from there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bhavani. I've already um, added her email address in the Zoom chat. Um, and Dr. Kavita, thank you so much also for your time. I mean, that was, wow, that, that was quite mind-blowing, like so much to learn, like, up to plumbing. Um, I, I think <laughs> that's something for, for us all to take, take back, you know, like not to be so tunnel vision, like you, we all, I mean, I think all doctors, when you think of, oh, I'm going to go into general practice and you only think of that one small part, and you don't think of the business aspect of it. So thank you so much. Um, is there anything else you want to share? Well, thank you, Selena. And uh, for everyone out there, know yourself, know what you want in life. And that's the first step. Medic Footprints is a really interesting place and uh, really grateful for Selena for setting this up because a lot of us doctors, we don't know what's the next step. And the only thing we know is, you know, the traditional way of come into medicine, go into the hospital or general practice. And uh, Selena has helped open up Medic Footprints. And so we can be more creative in being doctors. Yep. Okay, I, I've just I shared this uh, QR code. Uh, please scan this QR code and um, fill in the form. It's a feedback form so that we know what we can provide for you. We are planning, we are hoping to have more um, workshop courses to help enrich doctors with more skills that they can use because now I think it's a little hard. Um, it's a little more difficult to just be a doctor and come out because the competition is just so rife. So yeah, please uh, scan this and fill it up. Uh, okay, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, please do remember to follow us and um, hope to see you soon. The next one, um, we might do it on a weekday night. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, I'll post up the, the updates there. Okay, thank you so much. I'll see you guys soon. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.